So hey everyone, so today I want to be covering uh, two papers. Uh, so both of these papers are from uh, Michael Brownstein's research group, who's uh, the head of graph machine learning at Twitter. Uh, so one of them is going to be uh, about uh, geometric deep learning. So that's basically speeding up algorithms like nearest neighbor search. So given like a whole bunch of points, which points are close to one another. This is interesting to me since like my master's thesis uh, was about the topic uh, back in the day. Uh, and so I, like, I'm pretty sure this is going to be uh, really interesting. And I've been looking forward to sort of looking at a deep take on some of these problems. Um, and then the other paper is about temporal graph networks, where instead of viewing a graph as so, a sort of a static thing, you view it as a dynamic thing, as in like, let's say, take a social network, relationships change over time, people like each other, people create new friendships, new tweets get created. And so how can you still learn properties about a graph, given that you know this history about the graph and not just the state of the graph at a single point in time? Um, so yeah, I mean, so without further ado, let's just uh, let's get started. And as always, if you have any questions, like feel free to ask me in chat. All right. So geometric methods rely on tensors that can be encoded using a symbolic formula and data arrays such as kernel and distance matrices. So we represent an extension which supports over CPUs and GPUs. Uh, General purpose acceleration frameworks such as XLA, our library turns generic Python code into binaries whose performance are competitive with state-of-the-art geometric libraries such as uh, Phi, so oh, sorry. With that, it benefit of flexibility. So we perform an extensive evaluation on a broad class of problems, Gaussian modeling, uh, k-nearest neighbor search, geometric deep learning, non-Euclidean embeddings, and optimal transport theory. Uh, for geometric problems that involve 10 to the 3 or 10 to the 6 samples uh, in dimensions 1 to R, library speeds up baseline GPU implementations by up to two orders of magnitude. Oh, okay, I see. So uh, let's just write down some, uh, some quick notes. Okay, one, so we're talking about like 100x speedups. Then the problems are fairly broad, but basically it's anything that involves uh, geometry. Nearest neighbor search is like sort of the main one. Uh, you know, works with Python. By works with Python, I mean I, I works, I mean works with that layer of abstraction. And then works uh with both yeah hey Krishan, it's nice to see you let me know if you have any questions about what we're covering so we're doing two papers by uh, michael brownstein this is the first one a geometric learning and then the second one is going to be on uh, temporal graph networks So fast numerical methods are the fuel of machine learning research so the sustained development of the CUDA ecosystem uh, has driven the progress in the field. And though Python is a lingua franca, franca whatever. Uh, yeah, so this is very true, by the way. So generally, even though you think that you're programming in, in Python, you generally what you're programming in is, is in C++ with these languages. Like if you're doing something like TensorFlow or PyTorch, it's just that you have a Python API that's nice and easy to use. Uh, this means though that like if you're doing anything sort of weird, you end up with like C++ errors and that's just like much more difficult to debug if you're not familiar with the, I mean, that's like the whole two language problem is a is its own talk and I don't want to start talking about Julia right now. Um, so by recent advances in computer vision, uh, they stem from a mix of power and flexibility provided by PyTorch and general purpose accelerators such as XLA. So XLA, you should think of it like this is sort of like an LLVM for, uh, for deep learning. If I'm not mistaken, it's also the same creator, like, like Chris Lattner in both cases. All right. So geometric computation present a clear gap in performance between uh, Python and C++. Notable examples are implementations of point cloud convolution or nearest neighbor search. Uh, so to uh, scale up geometric computations to real world data, a common practice is therefore to replace the compute intensive parts of a Python code by handcrafted CUDA kernels. These are expensive to develop and maintain, which leads to an unfortunate need to compromise between ease and development of using scalability. So 
I'm actually very optimistic here. Like I think CUDA, it kind of sucks to have to learn CUDA. Like it's a closed source language that's controlled by a single company. Uh, so I'm very optimistic about Vulkan potentially being a, a replacement for this. But uh, I've heard secondhand that Vulkan is notoriously difficult to program. Uh, but I would hope that as they get more users, this is something that they would fix. So they present key up. So one, the first thing I'm curious about is like, what, what are these papers? So it's 35, 60, and 92. Let me know if I forget them, chat. 35, 60, 92. Uh, yes. Just one moment. So fast representation learning, deep learning with continuous bleed spline kernels, 60. PyTorch library for accelerating into deep learning research. Advances, oh, okay, okay, I see. 35 and 60. Okay, so the whole point of, uh, of uh, geometric deep learning is that generally a lot of problems that you, you like that are pretty, like let's say you're doing something like nearest neighbor clustering, right? So uh, you have a bunch of points and you want to figure out like which point is closest to all the others. So this could be like some form of clustering if you're doing data analysis. Uh, it could be, for example, figuring out like which sensor measurement is faulty or noisy. It could be, for example, trying to predict like where a 3D like skeleton is on a screen. Uh, all of these problems involve uh, geometry, like, like you're working over a Euclidean space, like the, the distances mean something in this case. Uh, and so how can you sort of speed this up, right? And and the, the, the core idea here is that a lot of times when it comes to making these things fast, uh, people write uh, CUDA kernels or like so custom C++ code to do this stuff. Like you can look at like stuff like Pow Pow Rabbit. Uh, you know, custom implementations of KD trees and people, you know, will do all sorts of compiler optimizations to make this fast. Uh, and so the idea here, I think, behind this paper is to say, well, like we can actually do some compiler optimizations at the Python level so that we can write performant geometric code uh, in, in Python. And so, like, yeah, so here, for example, they mentioned K-nearest neighbor search and geometric deep learning. So think of geometric deep learning, for example, as like you're trying to predict uh, the pose of a skeleton, for example. Uh, so non-Euclidean embeddings could be like, you know, you're working over some space and you're trying to figure out, for example, if two shapes are equivalent to one another, uh, but the distance metric they're in is not Euclidean. It's like some other weird metric space. Uh, and so how can you like do distances? And this is relevant for stuff like optimal transport theory, where you're trying to go from one uh, distribution to another for stuff like KL divergence is basically one example of this. Uh, What's interesting about KL divergence is it's not symmetrical. So the distance between two distributions isn't the same depending on where you start, which is counterintuitive, but is, you know, actually not true for most distance functions are not symmetrical. It's just the ones that we're used to in the real world are. So yeah, so, so I, I hope that answers the question. All right. So they present KOPS, uh, an extension for PyTorch, NumPy, and NumPy that combines the speed of a handcrafted CUDA kernel with the simplicity of a high-level language. Uh, optimizes MapReduce operations on generalized point clouds and provides transparent support for distance-like matrices as in in figure one. So they're fully differentiable, have negligible memory footprints, and they're competitive with state-of-the-art CUDA libraries and peerless in the many use cases that are not covered by existing implementations. Among other applications, we present optimal transport solvers and geometric operators in hyperbolic spaces, which are orders of magnitude faster than state-of-the-art. So we believe that our library is an important addition to the existing Arsenal tools that will have an... Okay, great. So what's a hyperbolic space? I'm curious. That's what's cool about ge geometry is that you always end up with like this crazy looking shit like this. Uh, reminds me a bit of like Islamic art, like in mosques and stuff. Anyway, yeah. So there's a constant negative curvature where the curvature is that sectional curvature. Okay. Okay, so two parallel lines aren't always parallel to one another. So given any line, yeah. 
So what, what does a space like this look like? So I guess here in this case, but we shouldn't be able to, yeah, so I guess this is like a line or something. I think like this is sort of hard for me to think about and I actually have this game. I think I've talked about it uh, on stream before. I think this game here, Hyper Rogue, uh, is a video game in hyperbolic space. And so it's like a good way to, I, I guess, get some intuition behind some of how this stuff should work. Uh, oh, it looks cool, right? Like, check this out. Spiral of Cthulhu. I think, I, unfortunately, this game isn't that fun. Like, it's cool, but, like, I can't really say I was, like, you know, enjoying my time with it all that much. Although the creator, I think, of Hyper Rogue has, like, a really fascinating Twitter account, and he always, like, publishes, like, the most interesting stuff. All right, so, like, let's see. So they're saying here, okay, well, we have this thing called the dense matrix, we have a sparse matrix, and you have a symbolic matrix, right? So with a dense matrix, you can imagine that, like, you basically have, uh, like, you know, like, like you have a 2D map. With the sparse matrix, like you're only storing the elements that are non-zero, so it's closer to a dictionary. Uh, and then what's a symbolic matrix? So for a third class of tensors called symbolic matrices, whose coefficients are given by a formula, mij is equal to f of xi that is evaluated on data arrays xy reduction operations are implemented using parallel schemes that compute the coefficients mij on the fly and we take advantage of the structure of CUDA registers to bypass costly memory transfers and optimal runtimes on a wide range of applications oh i see i see okay so okay i kind of get this like basically we're gonna have it looks like uh like two matrices so it's like a decomposition and then a function that works over both for indexing um so i guess this is sort of like the, the core idea i i can i can't explain to you yet how it works or why it works uh, one thing I'm curious about, is this an old idea? Like, let's see, symbolic array, symbolic array. Okay, I don't get anything with Google, so I'm, I'm guessing they've invented this term. Who's the author? Jean Fady, Benjamin, Benjamin Charlier, Joan Alexis Glunes. Oh, like, okay, so, so French and then maybe French as well. I always feel like French people are, are really good at theoretical math in general. Like, I see their names a lot show up on papers. Like a 2D hash table. Uh, like, you mean the symbolic array? Kind of, yeah. I mean, it's not like a 2D hash table. It's two hash tables that you're getting a value from. Because the 2D hash table is actually just a dense matrix. Right, so I mean, let's let's see how this works. Maybe maybe it'll make more sense in a bit. So there's a bunch of related work, uh, Obama is an interaction step of the form blah. Okay, so there's sparse matrices, nearest neighbor finders. Okay, wait, so help me remember some of the values here. So we have 11, 31, 49, 53, 65, 78, 85. Let's just check the first two. That's probably the most important ones, 11 and 31. Oh, interesting, okay. So yeah, let me explain this, because this is actually, whoa, like I, I did not expect to be revising any of this stuff in time soon, because I did all of this for my master's thesis. It was like eight years ago now or something, maybe maybe longer. Um, so basically the way, uh, you know, you can sort of imagine it this way, like typically when you're doing some sort of like nearest neighbor algorithm, like let's say you have a point, right? All right, so you're gonna have a point and then you have like a whole bunch of other points that are uh, in this data set, right? 
And so given a new point, figuring out, well, who's my nearest neighbor? Well, the trivial algorithm is that you look at each point and then you compute the distance to every other point. So this is big O of N, right? Uh, but for every new point that you're going to do this, you're going to, let's say you have K points that which you need to do this operation for. So the total running time is Kn. And so the idea is, can you do something better? And so the idea by something better would be, can you do something that's closer to K log N, right? And you can, if you basically spend N log N time uh, putting this in a data structure like a KD tree, which is you can think of it like a like a binary search tree, but over a geometric space. So it's a binary search tree if it's like one dimension, uh, but it's uh, like think of it like a multi-dimensional binary binary search tree. The uh, code looks very similar. There's multiple ways of doing this. Like there's uh, KD trees, random trees, PCA trees. It's a whole like body of literature uh, that you can do. Uh, and so the idea is okay. Well, you know you you you, you can use this. Uh, but these pre-computations are very expensive, right? So you notice, like, because it's n log n, uh, really this is only going to be worth it if k is much bigger than n, right? Otherwise, this is not going to be uh, worth the effort. So what sparse matrices, uh, uh, truncated reductions rely on random memory access, do not stream well on GPUs. Oh, this is interesting. Truncated. This method can be used whenever the operation f is local, but has a major limitation. Is like it using prune out negligible terms. We perform the reduction on a subset of neighbors. Data structure algorithm straight off. Um, yeah, l l l like I think again, like this sort of gets back to. Uh, I think they're just beating this with like a deep learning hammer. Like, I mean, I, I think this may be a, that kind of paper actually like solving this problem. It's like with the deep, with maybe like an MLP or something, like we'll see. Uh, but yeah, generally, like I would say like, uh, this is just like advice basically if you're ever doing a programming interview, uh, especially is that when you discuss the running time of an algorithm, uh, I would strongly suggest you sort of think out loud when these constraints may be true in the real world. Like for example, like, you know, you can tell the interviewer like, well, like if if K is going to be a lot smaller than N and, you know, here's why I think it would be smaller in this case, then I actually think doing linear search is actually the optimal approach and then you program it and you're done. Whereas if they tell you like, no, no, but actually K is going to be just like this absurdly high number, then you immediately know that the linear search algorithm is not going to work out. And I think this shows like a certain maturity in that like you're not thinking about uh, running times as this abstract thing, but it relates to... Uh, a use case, like, like basically, what is it that you're actually doing more in your algorithm? Like, are you doing, like, let's say more insertions, more deletions? And if so, like, just optimize for that at the expense of everything else. So then there's these uh, approximated convolutions. Uh, when the reduction is a sum and Kij is an invariant kernel, a discrete convolution. Most of them keep a focus on distributed learning or image processing and dense tensor manipulations. Uh, they pro both provide partial support for symbolic tensors. However, they have limited support for automatic differentiation and require the use of a custom low-level syntax to produce efficient binaries. Okay. So here, basically, uh, distributed learning. So what's the, what, which papers are they covering here, 63 and 64? Beyond data and model parallelism for machine learning. Interesting. I think I've read this paper before. So none of the aforementioned methods are fully suited for modern research and geometric data analysis. So let's briefly explain why. Some acceleration schemes do not stream well on GPUs or have to rely on expensive pre-computations like hierarchical matrices or advanced neural state can hardly be used in the training group of a neural network. Oh yeah, okay, I, I see. So KD trees can't be a pre-training method. 
So other strategies make strong assumptions on the property of the convolution filter on dimension of geometry of the ambient feature space, uh, where one wishes to have modeling freedom with the choice of embedding space geometry and dimension. Uh, expect users to be knowledgeable on GPU parallelism uh, or do not support the bottom is that most existing tools are not ready to be used by a majority of researchers in the community. Okay. Uh, when the reduction blam is a sum and f of i is equal to k x i minus y j, the interaction is understood as a discrete convolution. Okay, well, like, like to me, so, so let's think about this a bit. So this is basically saying, uh, like, can you make the indexing? So basically here, when we talked about the function uh, here, uh, if you make this function uh, translation invariant, then you don't actually need to look at the indices anymore. So you notice, right, you're only looking at the values uh, so only uh, look at values instead of uh, index. Okay, this is all fine. So, and they're basically saying that like most of these tools are like, I agree with this convolution thing seems cumbersome. Here, it seems like, you know, this is uh, like, you can't have this as a pre-processing step. So in order to tackle these issues, the developers of deep learning libraries have recently put an emphasis on just-in-time compilation for neural networks. The recent PyTorch, JIT, and XLA uh, enable operator fusion and unlock performance speedups for research code. And these general purpose compilers are fully transparent to users and show promise for a wide range of applications. Uh, nevertheless, they fall short on geometric deep learning. Just a moment. So we noticed that all of the aforementioned methods relied on a reductions of an N by M matrix that is often too large to be stored in memory as a dense tensor. Acknowledging the fact that memory management is a bottleneck for tensor programs, we choose to focus on the fundamental concept of symbolic matrices illustrated in figure one. And so we support, we, we add support for this kind of abstraction on the GPU with all desirable features of a deep learning library, a math friendly interface, high performance transparent support for best processing, automatic differentiation, and the example below is representative of our user interface. Okay, all of this looks Perform arbitrary symbolic computation. So let's look at this. So we have this thing called the lazy tensor, which is they're saying x dot view. So n is of size what? n is of size. Ten by five. Like okay. No, it's like it's. I think that's ten to the power five, right? So if it's ten to the power five. And then 1D, okay. Okay, so then we're doing, we're taking a symbolic matrix of the squared kernels. Okay, that's fine. I'm a bit surprised these aren't of the same, uh, they're not the same size. Uh, I wonder why, why that's the case. And then symbolic Gaussian kernel matrix. And then come back to genuine torch tensors with reductions on dimensions zero and one. Uh, so they're saying dij is our Cayman So K and N search of array indices. Okay, so so find the ten smallest neighbors. Uh, based on these distance matrix, and then do a dot product with this matrix B, and then take the derivative with respect to what exactly autograd of this with respect to X, I see.
So we rely on a fast parallel schemes to compute reductions of symbolic matrices as an equation one. On the CPU, uh, each thread i computes the value ai by looping over the reduction index j and consuming the values of f on the fly of f over the, over the reduction index j. On the GPU, we cut a and k by k tiles where k is the CUDA block size to leverage the low latency of shared memory buffer and blockwise memory access. This ensures optimal management of the Ys. We refer to our online documentation, kerneloperations.io. Let's check it out. Kernel operations. So what distance do they use here? So here I think they're just using Euclidean distance, right? So you can tell because they're taking the difference, like like yeah like square distance but they take the they take the difference and then they square it uh it's not it's not a custom distance it's just this function uh, it's just called squared euclidean distance the, the reason is like they don't want to have uh, zero distances right uh and so that's why square is popular you could also use like l1 if you want to just like the absolute value but it's fairly popular i guess even like when you're computing a loss in deep learning like you would typically use the square right so this is identical to here basically right because you're saying uh, well, not quite, because here you're multiplying by this B by this B matrix, but it's a similar idea. Oh wow, they have a full library. Who manages it? Yeah, they also have some benchmarks. That's cool. I really like this page, actually. It has many, many ideas. What's Hali there? This looks like the fastest. Uh... Oh, interesting. For fast, portable. This is really cool. Like I was never even aware like any of this work existed. Like Yeah, this is a dope page. Let me pull this. So it's interesting here that anything that has like larger number of elements. Uh, like a larger number of points, like PyTorch or PyTorch TPU just like unrun out of memory completely. I guess they didn't benchmark. Oh, no, they did benchmark TensorFlow actually as well. And it's slower. That's really weird actually. NumPy like. NumPy like, okay.
Yeah, it's, it's my first time hearing it. It looks like just like a fast tensor manipulation library in their own custom language. Uh, this guy's papers look really nice, actually. This looks great. I'm going to save all of this. So the low latency of the shared memory buffer and blockwise memory access. So the, okay, so we have a spammer. Let me just bend this. All right, I don't, I don't like this shit. Um, but anyway, here, um, so, so I think what they're doing is this. Like, basically, the first thing is that, like, so here, I think what they're doing is like when they're trying to figure out the nearest neighbor for. Uh, oh, I see how they're doing it. So, like, let's say they put all the like, like they basically duplicate the points, right? So here you have all the points, and here you have all the points again. So you pick a point and when you want to find its nearest neighbor, you go over the entire, uh, like you go over all the points one by one and you can do this in parallel in a multi-threaded way, right? So if you have, let's say, I don't know, 30 threads, uh, then you can check 30 points at once. So I'm going to say this is like uh, multi-threaded uh, nearest neighbor on CPU. And this is basically multi-threaded uh, nearest neighbor on GPU. The difference is uh, you're doing it in, in blocks because uh, like the way a GPU works is that it loads a block of memory faster. Uh, so you don't have to do it basically, uh, you know, a row, like, like row, like, and it, you, you shouldn't, you, you don't need to just take an individual column and look at all the, all the rows. You can take a block of columns uh, and then look at all the rows at the same time. And then the other one is like what they're calling like the shared memory buffer. Let's just quickly Google that shared memory buffer. Okay, all, all that looks like it means is that like it's just a bunch of memory that they can all access at once. Um, yeah, so I, I think this is what this is trying to say. Basically, when like let's say you have here a CPU and then you have here a, a GPU. The way you send data back and forth is with this uh with this form with this like you send it via like this thing called PCIe. Uh PCIe loads things in batches. Like basically if if it's not worth the, it's not, if, if the data transfer time is higher than your compute time, you, you like a GPU is not likely to be very helpful. Uh, and so if you send to the GPU one column at a time, it's not going to be very good. So you'd rather just send it like a whole batch uh, and then it can compute everything at once. And so I like, just to keep, keep in mind here, like when we talk about GPU threads, like, let me show you, right? So like 3080, 3090, GPU threads, like this is sort of like what we're talking about, right? So just just to give you some sense of the, where is it, threads. Also 2080 Ti number of threads. I think it's like in the thousands, like.
Yeah, so there's a thousand threads per multiprocessor. And how many multiprocessors are there? Oh. No, yeah, I think this is it. But basically we're talking like orders of magnitude more. Like let's say I have a really fancy CPU. It's uh, 32 threads. If you were to buy like an Intel Xeon or something, Intel Xeon uh, number of threads. Fuck's sake. Could I read the docs? Yes, thank you. Oh yeah, okay, yeah. Um, but basically like it's way higher, right? So like if you think of each of these threads as in like back to our nearest neighbor example, uh, like you can basically check 11, like like about a thousand uh, points at once, like to figure out who their nearest neighbor is. And that way you can sort of amortize it, like as opposed to just doing it for, for one point at a time, do it over a thousand because it just takes the same amount of time. Uh, so in their library, what they do is they uh, create uh, a live, they have this lazy tensor that turns dense arrays into symbolic arrays. Uh, and they use standard operations to build up arbitrary formulas. Uh, our math engine is lazy and defers evaluation of formulae until the reduction time. It is also versatile. Uh, we support batch dimensions, operator broadcasting, and a wide range of elementary operations. All right. The algorithm has big O and M time complexity, but does not allocate any buffer in the global memory. Oh, interesting. Uh, so big O and M time with uh, no memory overhead. Oh, this is interesting because this would be uh, good for IPU in general. Okay, interesting. There's this problem called register spilling. What's register spilling? Oh, I see. Okay. So like, it, it's like too much memory that you're allocating at once. So then it, you know, these just pull over to memory and then it's going to take a, a lot longer. Okay. So they actually, yeah, they used exactly the machine. I figured like the Intel Xeon with uh, 16 threads and then 128 gigs of RAM, 11 gigs of life memory. Um, Yeah, so the symbolic tensor is basically uh, here. So it's basically this abstraction, right? It sort of abstracts this away from you. Uh, but basically, as opposed to uh, having like a dense array, like you just call lazy tensor and then you, you can represent your matrix like as like this. Uh, we can take a look at the code actually after this and, and sort of get, get a 
uh, a better sense of how this works. Like, I guess right after we're done with the paper, like we're just gonna go to the, the, the paper because the code, it looks really good. So KOps can be used to implement K-means clustering with several metrics, implement standard expectation maximization on Gaussian mixture models. Um, Symbolic and impaired. I, I wasn't aware of TensorFlow or anything like this. Let me check if they mean the same thing. Oh, no, no. This means something else here. So I think here they mean the difference between uh, sequential and functional, right? So you see here, like it's like a function and then it goes through here. So there's two functions, one after the other. Whereas here, yeah, like they're gonna use this uh, Keras small sequential. So this is what they mean by symbolic. It, it means something completely different. Like like what, what symbolic means, uh, you're manipulating symbolic tensors. These are tensors yet that hold, won't yet hold data to build your graph. No, no, I think this means something completely different. Uh, so a symbolic tensor is just like an alternate way of representing uh, a, a dense matrix. Where as opposed to doing a straight indexing, you need to apply a function over two values of two different hash maps to be able to figure out uh, what the value is in it. So I, I think like once we look at the code, it should hopefully be clear. Like we'll just look at lazy kernel and how it works. I think here they're showing us how it works. Like let's say you're trying to do a K nearest neighbor search query, then okay, you have these two tensors, right? And then you take the distance between them. And then, yeah, so, okay, they do several. So they do the Euclidean distance, the Manhattan distance, and cosine similarity, and then they do the hyperbolic distance. Uh, and then they're saying, okay, well, I want to do K and N search with the hyperbolic metric, and I want to find the 10 nearest neighbors. Right, so... So the performance of our C++ engine holds up to scrutiny and KOps provides respectable runtimes on small um, and medium-sized problems up to 10 to the 6, D100 with the added benefit of flexibility. All right, that's all good. I think we need to look at the code now. Okay, geometric deep learning primitives. So for load dimensional KNN search has important applications in the field of geometric deep learning. Uh, to speed up too popular for 3D point cloud estimation, point CNN and graph CNN. Uh, deep graph, geometric descriptors of all scales on point clouds. Yeah, so let me just do like, uh, this is like point cloud estimation comes up a lot in the context of uh, self-driving cars. Or robotics right because you have some sort of like point cloud telling you like where there is an object and then you're trying to figure out like what's what's, what's close to what like what does the graph look like oh yeah computer graphics for sure actually like one class i've been really excited about going over is the keenan crane lectures but i haven't been able to do it I just haven't had the time. His his class looks so dope. I don't know, like, what is this like beautiful web page? I think it's the benefit of working in graphics. Like, you end up with like gorgeous graphs of all your work. I mean, yeah, like, do let me know what your thoughts are at some point because it's a class I'm I'm very curious about.
Okay, I think it's time to go over the code. So what's the library called again? Chaos. Right, so let's go to PyChaos. Okay, so I do want to just look at the syntax for lazy. Let me just get clone this. Oh yeah, that, that's great to hear. Like it definitely felt like the, the class was of really high quality. So the be clone. Okay, this is a lazy tensor pi. Okay, this doesn't look like a trivial <laughs> trivial project. Uh let's even do this actually. Do I have clock? This looks like a fairly uh complex project. Uh yeah, like I think it's similar in that like maybe PyTorch 3D has a bigger scope, but it's sort of a similar idea. Um yeah, this is a complicated project. Um uh, Yeah, damn. I'm actually really impressed. Like, um, so let's see what does lazy tensor look like. The words, the class, generic lazy tensors. Okay, what are the main functions it needs to support? Okay, so there's an init. Okay. Okay, and further dimension of the lazy tensor. Okay, fix variables. Separate arguments, promote, okay. Why are there two units? Maybe what we need is in the init actually. So let's see, are we dealing with simple numbers? Doesn't seem to be all that much going on here. I think I do like, uh, where was it? Um, oh, sorry. I've been using WSL actually uh, for the, for the most part for everything else. Makes me not have to worry about it. I feel like this like endless abstraction of VMs is getting very confusing. Like I have no idea what's going on at this point when I run a Linux command in the windows. Okay, basically, I think my takeaway here is going to be this is a complex project. So let's just write some uh, here back to the main paper. So what did we learn? So I think one, code is complex. It's about uh, 60K lines of code. Uh, two, uh, useful and fast for geometric nearest neighbor search for 
any metric space. And lazy tensor uh, as an abstraction over uh, PyTorch and TensorFlow array. Uh, the other thing is basically zero, it's basically zero NM computation with little uh, memory overhead. Um, all right, so I think now it's time for paper number two. I think the second paper is a lot simpler by the end of this one. This was, I, I did not expect this to be such a complicated systems paper. Uh, not that complicated, it's just like, I think this idea of, uh... okay, yeah, yeah. So, so actually I think I have the best way to explain this right now. So when you're doing nearest neighbor search, either you could store all of the values in a matrix, right? Or uh, you basically compute them on the fly. So this hash map is actually nothing but xi and yj are basically just points. Like the points that you want the, like let's say the points for which you want to find the nearest neighbor to. And then yi and y is the, is the points that for which the distance you'd like. Uh, and send the, so this is, has like two, two numbers here because it's an X and a Y coordinate because these are two D numbers in the specific visualization. Uh, there's actually absolutely nothing special uh, going on here. It's just basically instead of storing the values, you compute them on the fly. And you can compute them on the fly using really fast uh, kernels that they've built themselves. That's it. Basically, I think it sort of uh, falls into the strand of uh, recomputation instead of uh, storage. All right, so let's look at the other paper. So the other paper, paper is temporal graph networks. And so like I, I was saying this earlier, but uh, oh, it's also similar people, right? So there's David Einar, I think it's the same group of people, Bronstein. I think these are the common names, if I'm not mistaken. Fabricio, Federico, and Emanuele. Fabricio, Federico, yeah, no. So yeah, so I want to say one more thing here. So it's basically uh, any graphic space and then the applications basically creating a graph from a point uh, cloud data. So what this is about here is that temporal graph networks are uh, essentially graph neural networks where the data changes over time. Uh, and so we have a novel combination of memory modules and graph-based operators, and they significantly outperform previous approaches while being computationally more efficient. So um, I will say Michael Bronstein also has a blog post that's a medium blog post about this. Here, I'll show it to you. Uh, temporal graph. Yeah, here it is. I actually already went through this blog post. I mean, yeah, just use uh, incognito mode. You can read it. Right, so you can just go over this uh, over this blog post, uh, and it'll have all of the ideas that uh, you're you're looking for. So they're working on creating new dynamic graph benchmarks and tasks as part of the open graph benchmark. It doesn't look like they have uh, yet. Let's see, data sets, uh, node prediction. Yeah, they, they didn't uh, do it uh, yet.
<laughs> yeah, incognito is like a lifesaver. Um, okay, this is all fine and good. So, I mean, you can go over the, the medium blog post as well later if you want. I think I've already been on it on stream, so I was actually just curious about checking out the actual paper. One second, let me just turn on the, open up the lines. It's a bit dark here. All right, I'm back. So we perform a detailed ablation study of different components of our framework uh, and devise the best configuration that achieves state-of-the-art performance on several transductive and inductive prediction tasks for dynamic graphs. Okay, so gra basically here they say, okay, graphs are very useful. Uh, but, you know, most graphs are dynamic, like social networks. Uh, so they propose the first generic inductive framework of temporal graph network operating on continuous dynamic graphs, represented as a sequence of events that are specific instances of TGN. We propose a novel training strategy, and third, we perform... Uh, a detailed ablation study of different components of our framework. We show state-of-the-art performance on multiple tasks. Uh, deep learning on static graphs. Yeah, okay. Um, so basically you can think of it, uh, yeah, so both of these are Twitter papers by the way. So both of these are, are, are Brownstein papers. Uh, but basically when you, when you look at this, it's saying like, well, you can create a representation for a given node by uh, looking at the features of that node and combining it with a message to all its neighbors, uh, where all of its neighbors are basically like, again, this is sort of a sort of like a message passing algorithm, but basically the idea is very simple. Like I think the formulation here is a bit complicated. Basically, if this is your node, right, and you're trying to come up with uh, the features for this, you basically say it's equal to uh, VI, right and the neighbors of vi right and so the neighbors of vi each have their own features right uh so this has two parts it has the the features of the of the node level features of your neighbors uh, but also the edge level features for example uh let's say this was a social network right and then this says like for example this is mark and this is krishnan and this, this connection could be, well, we chatted, but then this other one here could be like Mazin and it says like, well, we didn't chat today. So it's different relationships. Uh, it's not just like, let's say friendship is one kind of relationship, but the relationships could be more concrete and represent like some sort of action that we've undertaken. Like for example, let's say either how, 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 how friends are we, right? And if it's one, that means we're best friends. And if it's zero, that means like we're, we just don't, don't know each other at all. Um, so for dynamic graphs, there's discrete graphs and there's continuous graphs. Uh, and basically they do continuous graphs by doing timestamps. So they basically turn it into a discrete graph. Uh, that's cool. Uh, the key contribution of this paper is a novel temporal graph network applied on continuous time dynamic graphs, uh, core modules. The memory state of the model at time t consists of vectors si, uh, okay, and then so we have a batch here and a message that's all cool and all. Uh, yeah, this message function we saw, the message aggregator, that's also cool. Um, yeah, sorry, like I I'm skipping over these details because like, let me just sort of explain it with less words. So when I say, for example, aggregate the, like your neighbor's features, where was it here? There's multiple ways you can do this. Like it can, for example, be you take the average of the features, or it could be uh, you take the max of the features, or it could be you put an MLP and you learn what the best feature to take is. Uh, so belief propagation is uh, here. Let's let's talk about this. I had another talk about this. Like uh, what you're getting at is interesting. So belief. So this is not actually. So it belief propagation is part of it, right? It's sort of. Uh, belief propagation on top of a GNN is basically what this is doing. Uh, what's very interesting is I think, and you'll enjoy this paper, uh, label 
uh, propagation. I had a stream about this as well. Uh, so there's this paper uh, here by Horace Hu and a bunch of other folks at Facebook. And they basically showed, I think, what your intuition is telling you is that, well, maybe you don't need GNNs and you just need a label propagation. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'd highly recommend you go over it. Like, I, th I think this is, a, this is a great paper. Okay, let's go back. Okay, right. So here they're saying, okay, here's how the embedding works. So they're saying, well, okay, so, so sorry. So, so the, the way this changes, though, is that now the graph is changing over time, right? And so what you want to do then is basically make sure that you can keep the old state. And the way they do this is they say, well, uh, so L is a layer, right? So let's say this is a multi-layer uh, network. And so, well, to get the representation of a given node at the L layer, uh, you basically look at uh, the layer before it, and then I think this is going to be the changes in the network. What is h hat? I think this is the changes, but I, I don't see it unless I'm blind here. Yeah, like label propagation, I think is just an older idea than GNNs. Like, in it, it, it's not like it's it's not that it's this or that. It's it's sort of it's both. As in, when you're computing features based on your neighbors, you're using label propagation, but then you have some sort of MLP on top of that to be able to actually make some sort of useful prediction on top of the features that you've built with label propagation. So. Yeah, so here then they're they're using attention, uh, which is interesting. So they have like the K uh, V uh, here, uh, and then I don't know what this phi is. A generic time encoding. Okay, yeah. So this is close to the positional encoding in in neural networks. So basically, you're saying, uh, well, this representation is dependent at, of, of this time, uh, and then. We're saying here Q, uh, oh, I see there's K, Q, K, V, Q, K, C, what's C? Uh, so each layer amounts to performing multi-headed attention as a reference node, the target node, uh, and the keys and the values are its neighbors. Uh, yeah, so basically here, instead of just saying like, let's say, uh, so for example, we talked about message passing being one way of doing this. Instead of message passing, for example, you could have multi-head attention as your neighborhood aggregation function, uh, and then you end up with a, with a transformer, right? So this is how the these two uh, worlds uh, uh, meet as well. So H0j, it allows the model to exploit both current memory and the temporal node features. So the temporal graph sum is a simpler and faster aggregation over the graph. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, this is this is what I figured. So this is this is all cool and all. Uh but here, for example, they're just saying, well, we, we have like a like this is just the one linear layer, right? It's like a large W. And then this is a linear layer over the past state and then the current new state based on the changes in time. And then you pass that uh to okay, so yeah, so they're getting the fast encoding uh as a as a relu over sigma. What what was what was this again? Phi. I think they explained it. A generic time encoding. Oh, I see. Like the difference in time, right? Because, uh, okay, yeah. So they're appending the difference. It's exactly like positional embeddings in BERT, by the way. It's like exact similar idea, but you're doing it from time. The edge level features, and then this. Uh, the graph embedding modules mitigates the staleness problem by aggregating information from a noise neighbor memory. So, okay, it can be trained for a variety of tasks around classification. Uh, 
temporal encoding, yeah. Uh, I guess like yeah, it's a difference in, in time. I, I think this is what this is trying to say. Like the further away, the, the I guess the different the feature should be different. This is the edge level feature to all the neighbors that you're paying attention to, right? So this is why this is T instead of uh, count of an I, because you can only pay attention to fixed amount of stuff. The and then what what your feedback was at the previous layer. Right, so this is kind of like an RNN actually. Like this is, I, I think this is the the point that they make actually in the in the in the blog post. So they use Wikipedia, Reddit, and Twitter with sort of detailed in the Pedinx eight point three and their experimental setup. Oh, interesting. So it's just like a... Layer neural network. I just want to read the appendix to see how they prepared the data set. Okay, so they manually made this graph dynamic by looking at the Rexus uh, data set. Um, so I think like what, what we'll do now is that like, let's see. So they're saying learning rate, the patients of five, average precision. They're conducted on AWS P3 and the results are average over 10 runs. Okay, let's look at the code. Let's look at the actual source code. Train, supervise. Okay, here's the model. And then TGN. 
Yeah, so it uses PyTorch. This is a complicated, big, complicated model. Where's the forward pass? Get embedding model, get message aggregator, memory, affinity score, Okay, yeah, like, look, like, let's say if you look at the attention layer, it looks a bit simpler. What's merge layer? Just cat stem. Self.act. Yeah, you see this? So this is like a very common trick I like a lot in deep learning frameworks. Like you can just like cat uh, two different layers. And then let's say, so here they're doing an act, like let's say you could do like, then you could say torch.flatten and then X and then pass this to a fully connected layer. And that's like sort of an interesting way of combining uh, various different networks, like with one line of code. So what's, uh, is this something torch act? Okay, merge layer, multi-head attention, self-key dimension, number of heads, drop out forward. previous memory that we have shown compared to this pgn identity the only difference is that we have the graph embedding module we want to compute the embedding for okay so how does this a train let's say a train this is in the download data set So do they just like take, I guess, like multiple snapshots of the Wikipedia data set? Uh, oh, but it's okay. Uh, you said Julia is differential by its own and we get neural XCP program X and did I? Okay, so I have a small question on the ML stagnation blog post. Hope it's okay to ask it. So you said Julia is differentiable by its own and we get neural X if you program X. Uh, yeah, that is correct, actually. I mean, th that's sort of like what you get by default if you're programming something in, in PyTorch or in, uh, uh, in TensorFlow. And like in Julia's case, like the entire language is like that. And so it makes it a bit easier. The main reason I make this distinction is it may, it may seem like pedantic, but uh, PyTorch is not Python. Like it's, it's a language on top of Python uh, with different, slightly different semantics, like slightly different code. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, you can do everything within PyTorch or TensorFlow. Like that's totally valid. Like from that setting, you don't really need Julia. Uh, so I guess it comes down to a matter of personal preference, but I, I do feel like sort of not tacking stuff on board of Python is, is, a, is a better approach. I think that the reason I'm also saying this is because like when it comes to more differentiable science code, I see more interesting stuff happen in the Julia space than I do in the, in the Python space in general. So let's use memory.
How do they fit all of Wikipedia if it's five terabytes in size? Number of batch. How are there multiple batch sizes too? Because I thought that. Let's look at this a bit. Uh, yeah, exactly. If you write a graphic render in PyTorch, you will get a differentiable render. Which basically means you can take an infinitely small step in the rendering process. Like that's sort of the, of the benefit. And smoothly interpolate among them, right? So you can sort of half render something, whatever that means. <laughs> So batches. Search up to node features. I think I just need to ask Emanuele this question directly because I don't get this. So What's the T-batch algorithm? Oh, I see. It basically... Uh, treat time as batch mechanism. What's T batch? Mario. You see Kumari all somewhere? Keep mentioning them, but they, they don't show up. Uh, Kumar AL 2019. Stabilizing off ball CQ learning, what? That's not what I wanted. Oh, thanks for Sean. Good night. Thank you. Oh, well, I'll see. All right, so the, the main thing that's here that's making me think really hard is I'm still figuring out how to actually run these things on a GPU. It sounds like, well, if you're, if you're batching stuff to update embeddings 
in a bad step, but then it's sort of a separate problem doing the predictions and stuff. I think this is more the embedding problem. I can see how you can do on a GPU, but I'm not sure how you would still do some sort of prediction at a, at a graph level. Uh, so that's like something I need to think more about. Uh, but uh, I'll think about it and let you know maybe in a, in a future episode. Uh, in the meantime, sort of what we learned here is that you can uh, deal with temporal graph data if at every node you're basically building an embedding of its history plus its current actions. Uh, and you can do that by basically just having uh, like an MLP on the past actions or like some, sometimes something more complex like multi-headed attention. Regardless of the neighborhood aggregation scheme that you use, you keep uh, your like you keep your state for the uh, for the uh, for for what you've already seen, and then you basically append that to the new observations that you're seeing to create yourself a new state, and then use this embedding to be able to make some node level predictions uh, in a in, in a in a supervised way. Uh, so yeah, so I, I hope this was helpful. Uh, you know, I think I'm gonna call it for now. Maybe I'll play some video games later. But in all cases, like you know, thank you for uh, for joining in and let me know if you have any more questions about how to get these graphs to work.